Dinosaur. What does that word conjure up in your mind? A large snarling beast with a jaw full of sharp teeth? A huge scaled animal with a long tail and extended neck? Or a creature topped with ostentatious plates with sharp spikes protruding from its tail? In truth, all of these are dinosaurs, but with all the different types, paleontologists have come up with a way of divvying these up into different groups. Connecting this to their relationship via evolution by natural selection is what we call cladistics. Any research into the word dinosaur brings up Sir Richard Owen. He coined the term in the late 19th century, founded the Natural History Museum in London, helped with the spread of Victorian dynamania, and was also a massive elitist dick. The scientific name Dinosauria means terrible lizard, and was based on three animals, Iguanodon, Megalosaurus, and Hyliosaurus. This was based on all three being unusual because their hips were fused to their vertebra. While this definition is still part of the story, things changed. We now know that these three looked more like this, and some more features were needed. There are lots of little things, but as well as the fused hip, there are twin grooves on the tibia, crest on the humerus, and most distinctively, walking upright while other reptiles have legs that stick out sideways. So far, I've stayed on safe ground, but from this point on, I have to clarify that I will be using the Benton classification. This is the most common system used, and while a lot of other systems have come up in recent years, this remains the most robust, and most changes to it tend to be minor. Cladistics is the study of relationships between groups of animals. It focuses on showing these relationships rather than drawing an evolutionary chain. Let me explain. You've probably seen this, The Road to Homo Sapiens, originally by F. Clark Howell, although probably in a more comical context. What most people don't realise is that it does not show a linear progression. The common perception is that the relationship looks like this, one evolving into another. The actual relationship looks more like this. Each creature is its own, the cladogram showing the common relationships. For example, Homo habilis did not evolve into Homo sapiens. Some of their ancestors did. If this still looks too much like a linear progression, it is perfectly fine to show it like this. It's a bit more complicated, but shows the same information. Your primary and cladistics over, without having to pay exorbitant tuition fees, we can now begin. The first split between the dinosaurs occurred in the arrangement of the hip. All hips are composed of the ilium, ischium, and pubis. It is the position of this pubic bone that creates the split. Pointing forwards, it looks similar to a reptile's hip, so these were called the saurisians, or lizard hip dinosaurs. The others had a pubis that pointed backwards, resembling a bird, so these were called the ornithisians, or bird hip dinosaurs. These ornithisians were the most widespread and diverse group in the whole Mesozoic era. One of the earliest examples is Pisanosaurus. It is only known from a few fragments, but it provides a glimpse at what the earliest ornithisians may have looked like. Small, two-legged, or bipedal herbivores. The first major group of the ornithisians was the heterodontosaurids. The features of a heterodontosaurid are a fused ischium and pubis, a palpebral, a small bone projection inside the skull, and a predentary, a beak-like end of the lower jaw. Examples of this group include, of course, Heterodontosaurus and Tian Yulong, one of the Chinese dinosaurs with evidence of quills. The next group to come about were the Thyreophorans. These started looking similar to their common ancestor with Heterodontosaurids, but with one important difference. As seen in Scutellosaurus, they had scutes, little knobs of bone that afforded the animals some protection. This was taken to extremes by the later Thyreophorans, the Stegosaurs and the Ankylosaurs. The Stegosaurs had small tubular skulls, short legs which led to an arched back, and the little scutes had developed into large plates. Debate is still ongoing about what they were actually for. Examples of this group are Stegosaurus, Kentrosaurus, and Tujangosaurus. The Ankylosaurs, by contrast, are defined by a heavy armoured skull, spikes over the shoulders, protection over the hips, and a bony club on the end of the tail. In this group, the little scutes developed into armour so complete that some species' eyelids were armoured. Examples include Ankylosaurus, Europlocephalus, and Nodosaurus. 
The next group were the Marginocephalians. Although we don't know what they started off like, although almost certainly bipedal, they had something strange going on with their skulls, producing the pachycephalosaurs and the ceratopsians. The main feature of the pachycephalosaurs was the very thick fused skull. They also had bony eyebrows and various ornaments like spikes on the back of their skulls. This group include Pachycephalosaurus and Stegoceras. The Ceratopsians had a high snout, rostral bones forming a beak, and an extended parietal bone on their skulls, which produced the famous frill. Their skulls also had a triangular shape when viewed from above. Examples are Triceratops, Psittacosaurus, and Styracosaurus. The last group of Ornithisians are the Ornithopods, which include the group commonly called the duck-billed dinosaurs. They had long forelimbs, often used as arms and legs, and ossified tendons along the back and tail, making them very stiff. The hip also changed. The post-pubic process, the part pointing backwards, was reduced, while the pre-pubic process, the part pointing forwards, expanded. These dinosaurs spread all over the world as one of the most successful dinosaur groups. They include Iguanodon, Edmontosaurus, and Parasaurolophus. Now let's have a look at the lizard-hipped saurisians and the sauropodomorphs. One of the earliest examples of this group was Thecodontosaurus. This is where sauropods developed a long neck with Thecodontosaurus's ten vertebrae, but their forelimbs were still only half as long as their hind legs, making them still bipedal. The first major groups of sauropodomorphs were the platyosaurids, often called the prosauropods. While having a variety of interesting features, this group is mainly defined as like Platyosaurus and not quite a proper sauropod. This group includes, of course, Platyosaurus and sometimes dinosaurs like Massospondylus. The first group of true sauropods were the Euhelopidids. They had at least four sacral vertebrae, vertebrae fused to the hip. They also had four legs two thirds the length of their hind legs, leading some to wonder whether they held their long necks up or out. Examples of this group are Euhelops and Kiawan Long. Next came the Neosauropods, and the first group was the Diplodocids. These were defined by their very long outstretched neck, containing at least 15 vertebrae. To support this, they also had very strong ligaments over the hip to anchor the neck and the tail. This group includes Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, and Supersaurus. The next group were the Camarasaurids. This group developed different shaped back vertebrae and changed their hands, so they were walking more on their fingers than earlier groups. They also had short skulls, with 17 or fewer evenly spaced teeth. This group include Camarasaurus and Lorinosaurus. Next were the Brachiosaurids. This group were defined by their upright posture, reaching high to the treetops. Four legs longer than hind legs allowed the neck to rise right off the shoulders, and they had a short tail as less counterbalancing was required. Examples of this group are Brachiosaurus, Giraffotitan, and Lusotitan. And finally, there were the Titanosaurids. This group is famous for including some of the largest land animals ever to walk the planet. However, size is not a defining feature. The only real diagnostic characteristic is a type of ball and socket joint between the vertebrae. Titanosaurs are found mostly in South America, where sauropods flourish during the Cretaceous. Also, having huge examples does not help, as only vertebrae or leg bones are often found. This group include Argentinosaurus, Milawisaurus, and Alamosaurus. The other group of saurisians were the theropods. The first theropod is debatable, but it was probably something similar to Herrerasaurus. There is the group Herrerasaurids, but while they were saurisians, whether they were theropods or a third branch along with the sauropodomorphs is unclear. The first definite group of theropods were the Coelophysisoids. They had more open hips, vertebrae that interlocked, and flexible articulated jaws. Examples of this group are Coelophysis, Procompsognathus, and Dilophosaurus. The next group is the Ceratosaurids. The main feature of this group are skull ornament, like horns, and a large head compared with the body. Examples include Ceratosaurus and Genidodectes. Next come the first group of titanotheropods, the carnosaurs. These were the start of the really big theropod dinosaurs. Their thighs were longer than their tibias, and their jaws were especially long and narrow. 
The typical early carnosaur is Megalosaurus. The carnosaurs split into the allosaurs and the spinosaurs. Allosaurs had a heavy tail, 28 vertebrae in the spine, and loose articulation of the jaw, which meant that allosaurs could open their mouths incredibly wide. This group were amazingly successful in the Jurassic and grew to immense sizes in the Cretaceous. Examples of these include Allosaurus, Giganotosaurus, and Carcharodontosaurus. Spinosaurs had large, powerful, grasping arms, long crocodile like snouts, and spines coming off the vertebrae. The longest belonged to the infamous Spinosaurus, but also in this group are Suchomimus and Baryonyx. After the Carnosaurs were the Silurosaurs. These are the group of dinosaurs in which evidence of downy feathers have been found. The first group is the Tyrannosaurs. These had powerful hind legs, very short forearms, and long conical teeth. This group include the famous Tyrannosaurus, Daspletosaurus, and Gorgosaurus. The final group of theropods are called the Maniraptors. These include dinosaurs with fully fledged feathers. One of the groups here are the Dromaeosaurs more commonly referred to as the raptors. These had a distinct curve in the neck, about 60 serrated teeth, their hands were about half the length of the whole arm, and they had that iconic sickle-shaped claw on each foot. Examples from this group include Dromaeosaurus, Velociraptor, and Utahraptor. You might also notice that that pubis is looking a little backward, less lizard-like, and more bird-like. Finally, there are the avians. This is where the line is drawn between avian and non-avian dinosaurs, the former referring to the birds. And what are the features of a bird? Ask 10 experts, and they'd probably give you 15 different answers. So many Maniraptor dinosaurs are being found now that the line is constantly shifting. It looks less like a line, and more a swath of grey. Does a bird have to be capable of powered flight, or will gliding do? Does it disqualify it from being a bird if it has teeth? Does it have to be the ancestor of all modern birds? Possible examples of early birds are Archaeopteryx, Confuciusornis, and Archaeornis. I would be remiss in not telling you that all that we have looked at is still debated. In future dinosaur profiles, I will be discussing some of the arguments about the relationships between dinosaurs and dinosaur groups. But with the help of this video, I won't have to spend 10 minutes explaining every time. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, show your appreciation with a thumbs up and share it with others. Maybe subscribe if you'd like to see some dinosaur profiles on some of the animals mentioned here. Why not post a comment about which dinosaur you'd like me to do a profile on next? Maybe you heard the name of a dinosaur that you'd like to know more about. Note, I will not be doing Tyrannosaurus rex in my next profile. I will be doing it eventually, I just want more experience so I can do it justice. If you want to further support this channel, I have a book available on iBooks. It's interactive has original illustrations, and has a number of interesting dinosaurs in it, each occupying a different dinosaur group. Link in the description. My next video will be a dinosaur profile on that archetypal prosauropod, Platyosaurus. Hope to see you then.